So the next speaker, uh, Ray Stricker, who has his medical degree in uh, uh, internal medicine training at Columbia University, and he subspecialty in, in hematology and oncology at University of California. Also uh, training in immunology at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. He's the medical director of Union Square Medical Associates in San Francisco. He's the past president of ILADS and on the board of ILADS, member of the American Society of Hematology, uh, Federation of Clinical Immunological Societies, and the American Federation for Medical Research, and the American Society for Reproductive Immunology. He's received the award from the American Medical Association for Physician Excellence and an Outstanding Reviewer Award for the Annals of Internal Medicine. He's authored over 200 medical journals, not just on Lyme disease, but also coagulation disorders, emerging infectious disease, immunodeficiency, immunological infertility, and he's one half of the dynamic duo. Whenever there's these uh, articles that come out and there's a rebuttal needed, um, he often uh, steps up to the plate and uh, gives a very good uh, answer, and, and we appreciate his efforts in doing that. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing to work for me. It's my computer. I ought to know how to use it. Uh, Um, well, I'm going to shift gears a bit and uh, talk about patients who were fortunate enough to get diagnosed with neurologic Lyme disease and what we all should, should, well, can do for them and what we should be doing for them to make them better. And um, first of all, you know, I was thinking, I, I think I stole this from another meeting and we should really give this slide out to every speaker so they could have a uniform way to disclose their uh, conflicts. And my only disclosure is that I am on the advisory panel for QMED RX. Uh, I have no financial ties to the company and I have no other conflicts to declare. Now, as you all know from attending this meeting, Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne disease in the world today. Uh, the erythema migrans or bullseye rash uh, may be followed by musculoskeletal and neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, the etiologic agent is a spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi, that may cause persistent infection. And for those of you who were asleep through the first day of the meeting, uh, treatment of Lyme disease is controversial. Um, now, there are a number of neurologic and neuropsychiatric symptoms that are associated with, with Lyme disease, and I've listed them on, on this slide, and also signs of neurologic Lyme disease. Uh, facial nerve palsy is the one that's most uh, easy to recognize, but there's also cerebral vasculitis, uh, demyelinating lesions, meningoencephalopathy, radiculoneuropathy, the psychiatric symptoms that you heard described by Sheila and Judy. And then uh, findings on the MRI, uh, brain scan, and SPECT scan um, that may or may not indicate a neurologic infectious process. Uh, now, it's really easy to recognize Lyme disease when you see a patient like this. Uh, most of you can recognize this as a case of Bell's palsy or seventh nerve palsy, which is a hard sign of, of Lyme disease. It's a lot harder when you see a uh, MRI scan like this, uh, which has these punctate lesions, and this, the radiologist will look at this and, if it's a good radiologist, will have Lyme disease in the differential, but very often the radiologist will just say, well, I don't really know, this could be anything, it could be MS. Um, only about 20 to 30 percent of patients with neurologic Lyme disease will have a positive finding on MRI. So that is one problem. If you rely on the MRI to make a diagnosis of neurologic Lyme disease, uh, you may not uh, be able to. A much better option is the SPECT scan. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to be able to order one, uh, the, the SPECT scan does show perfusion defects uh, in the brain that are associated with neurologic Lyme. And you can see here on the left side, there are these blue areas that 
of low perfusion uh, after treatment with intravenous ceftriaxone, there's improved perfusion throughout the brain. And this is a very typical kind of finding on the SPECT scan in patients with neurologic Lyme disease. So the SPECT is really a much better option uh, for, to, to, to try to help diagnose these patients. Uh, now, as you've heard probably in different places, maybe this morning from Dan Cameron, uh, there are two standards of care in treating neurologic Lyme disease, one from the Infectious Diseases Society of America, which says that intravenous antibiotic therapy should be limited to 30 days, period. Uh, however, uh, ILADS takes a more open-ended view uh, of this therapy, saying that therapy should be tailored to the patient's symptoms and response to that intravenous antibiotic therapy. And that's why partly we have this controversy because of these very uh, divergent recommendations. Now, the reason that IDSA wants to limit treatment is, is um, uh, illustrated in this quote from the president of IDSA at the time, Henry Mazur, who wrote to Governor John Corzine, who was the head of the uh, National Governors Conference, saying that long-term antibiotic therapy may be dangerous, leading to potentially fatal infections in the bloodstream as a result of intravenous treatment in patients with neurologic Lyme disease. And it's interesting that, this, that, that Dr. Mazur would say this about Lyme disease because the IDSA has a whole bunch of diseases that they like to treat with long-term antibiotics and where they don't really find any danger at all. Some of those are shown on this slide, and you have things like drug-sensitive and drug-resistant tuberculosis, leprosy, atypical tuberculosis, uh, actinomycosis, Whipple's disease, Q fever endocarditis, and my personal favorite, which is alveolar echinococcosis, which you probably don't see very much because it's only in certain parts of the world. Uh, these diseases uh, require treatment with multiple antibiotics for various periods of time that are shown on this slide, you can see anywhere from six to nine months of treatment. And again, the reason why I like the alveolar echinococcosis is that the mean treatment for that disease is 5.7 years. Even with that length of treatment, about 30% of those patients will relapse after having this extended therapy, and that will require additional treatment. And that, for the IDSA, is okay. Another area where extended treatment is approved by IDSA is for children who have non-functioning spleens. Uh, and this can include children with sickle cell disease or those with traumatic uh, splenectomy, post-traumatic splenectomy. Here there are various guidelines from different parts of the world, and you can see on this slide that the average treatment or prophylaxis with antibiotics in these patients ranges from anywhere from three to five years up to lifelong antibiotic treatment to avoid severe consequences of a splenia, such as uh, fatal sepsis. So in these cases, lifelong treatment with antibiotics is approved by the IDSA and apparently is not dangerous. The most recent addition to this list comes from the New England Journal of Medicine, and this was a study of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and what um, this study involved was treatment of these patients for one year with prophylactic azithromycin monotherapy, just azithromycin daily for one year versus placebo. And what they found was that the patients who had azithromycin prophylaxis had significantly less exacerbations of their COPD and significantly lower mortality. So prophylaxis with azithromycin for one year perfectly acceptable for patients with COPD. One interesting aspect of this study is that the patients who got azithromycin all had resistant bacteria in their airways, that, the bacteria that were resistant to azithromycin, and yet they didn't get sick and they didn't get infected, which was a finding that remains unexplained in this study. So um, we set out to evaluate what to do with our patients with chronic neurologic Lyme disease. And the, so there are two goals in, in um, these studies. Part one, to evaluate the safety of intravenous antibiotic therapy in a cohort of patients with chronic neurologic Lyme disease. And part two, to assess the benefit of intravenous antibiotic therapy in this cohort of patients with chronic neurologic Lyme disease.